Hello, welcome to the Research and Disinformation series. These videos were made possible by a partnership between the library and the rhetoric department at the University of Iowa. My name is Chris Way, and all my work on the series has been in collaboration with Tim Arnold and Katie Hassman. In this episode, episode two, Bias is a Red Herring, we're going to do a deep dive into bias. So by the end, you'll be able to talk about bias, identify its various characteristics, and describe strategies for dealing with it in your own research. Well, it has all nothing to do with a disappearing nuclear physicist and Colonel Mustard's work on the new fusion bomb. No, communism was just a red herring. The reference to an idiom of a red herring in the title, by the way, is, just means that it's a distraction. You've probably been taught to avoid bias entirely. And yes, sure, bias can be troubling and frustrating. It can even be dangerous. But when people tell you that a source is useless because it's biased, they are maybe not understanding the big picture of just how bias works and how ordinary it is. From the perspective of evolutionary biology, for instance, bias is an essential part of being alive. It's in a way a survival instinct. So I want you to kind of forget about considering whether bias is good or bad. It just is. It's expected. It's inevitable. To clarify this corrective, I'm going to remind us of another term, disinformation. Now you'll remember from episode one, where we defined all of our terms, that disinformation is the bad guy, the supervillain, the thing to really watch out for. We defined disinformation as information that's factually inaccurate or misrepresented, uh, or put simply, disinformation is a lie. I was lying. <laughs> it was a lie. Bias, on the other hand, is quite different. A source that's biased is just a source that exhibits some kind of preference. But as we noted in episode one, sometimes this preference is gonna be invisible, so we have to read between or around the lines to see what it is. There are some systems in place on an institutional level that help mitigate the dangers of bias, uh, things like peer review systems, but we'll talk more about peer review in a future episode about authority. Here, our job is just to talk about strategies that we might use to identify and analyze bias as individual researchers. One strategy is we could look for evaluative language. Now, what I mean by evaluative is language that assigns value to a phenomenon or a state of affairs or a person, etc. This is different than descriptive or analytical language. Descriptive claims are claims that will describe, right? So you could say that this banana is yellow, uh, or this banana is unpeeled, or you could say that I'm holding it in my hand, right? These are all descriptive claims. They are statements of fact. An analytical claim would be one that takes the facts into account to build some kind of analysis, to point out some kind of overall pattern or to make a prediction. So if you told me that based on this banana's color, it's ready to be eaten, that's a culinary analysis. Or if you told me that based on what you've seen me do, it seems to be the case that I often buy bananas and I'm likely to buy them again next time I go grocery shopping. That would be maybe an economic or a behavioral analysis. Uh, these are analytical claims. They're statements that analyze. An evaluative claim then is one that evaluates or casts judgment, something more along the lines of that banana looks delicious or Chris is holding the banana in a weird way or the banana metaphor is not helping. <laughs> Um, these are evaluations. They are statements of opinion. Now, often when you hear a lot of evaluative language in a piece, when there's a lot of opinions, it may be a signal that the speaker has some preference or bias. And in the worst cases, they may be using this kind of language on purpose to shift your opinion as a reader, to persuade you to accept their conclusions regardless of the facts. A second strategy that we could use to identify bias is we could look for what I'll call selective focus. Is the source you're looking at focused only on a small selection of the available facts and opinions that might be relevant to the issue at hand? Are there certain contexts or perspectives that are important but that are being conspicuously left out? This might be the sign of a source being biased. I'm confused. I'm confused. This is all getting very abstract, I know. So I want you to practice something with me, something hands-on. I want you to find a book 
that you have recently read or an article or a tweet even, honestly, any text that you've engaged with and that you remember. It could be fiction or nonfiction. I'm going to go find some myself and I'll be back in a few seconds, but feel free to pause the video if you need more time to find your own. Okay, I want you to think about how this text positions itself with a certain point of view. A certain point of view. A certain point of view? Here's some examples from my shelves. You can see that this book here, uh, We Should All Be Feminists, has a full prescriptive sentence in its title. So clearly there's a sense in which it's carving out an ideological space. It's, in other words, foregrounding or front-loading its position before you even open it up to read. It's clearly a text with bias or a preference in favor of feminism and against anti-feminism. Now, of course, if you were to actually read this whole book, you would notice that the author adds quite a bit of subtlety and nuance and detail to what she means by the word feminism, and she goes to great lengths to anticipate and respond to and disarm some of the presuppositions and baggage that readers might bring to the text and to that word specifically. But the point stands that this book clearly has a point of view, a preference, and that its point of view is made explicit even on its cover. This is also true of something like this book or this book or this book. The argument, at least the ostensibly central argument, is laid out right in the beginning. You will often see this strategy with articles online and with short form media, but sometimes, of course, with books. But there's other texts like this one that are more opaque. They don't tell you from the title or headline or cover what position they're going to take in any particular discourse. So finding the biggest biases undergirding texts like this might require quite a bit more digging. It's important to note that in either case, whether the text warns you about its biases or not, there's always going to be some digging to do. Which brings us to our exercise. I want you to consider the book in your hand, or the text that you found, and ask yourself three questions. You can pause this video at any time, of course, to give yourself a moment to reflect on these, and if you're in a classroom setting or a shared apartment space, it might be helpful to take a moment to talk with a neighbor and to think through these questions out loud. But here they are, three questions. Question one, what are the assumptions that this text makes about the world? So here's an example that might seem silly. The Very Bad Bunny. It's a children's book about a bunny who often misbehaves. The book seems to be taking for granted this strange worldview in which there is such a thing as a good person, a bad person, or a bad bunny. And not just bad behavior, but badness as a trait. So I find this a little bit troubling, to be honest. But maybe my interpretation of the book's biases is in itself biased. So if you've read this book too and you feel differently, definitely send me an email. Question two. What kind of perspectives does this text amplify? And what kind of perspectives does it leave out? This is that selective focus phenomenon that we were talking about earlier. Question three, does this text use evaluative language? And if so, what kind, how often, and in what context does it use that kind of language? Now, keep in mind that you can do this sort of analysis with fiction as well as nonfiction. If I'm looking at A Tale of Two Cities, it doesn't matter that the book is a novel and not an academic argument. It still has perspectives. It has characters. So I might ask myself, what kind of characters does Dickens choose to pay attention to over others? What kind of evaluative language does Dickens use in describing these people or these settings or these events and so forth? So at any rate, thank you for indulging that little exercise. I hope it was helpful. The last point I want to make is to disabuse you of a notion that you've likely been taught. A lot of people, when they talk about bias, they think only about political bias, left versus right, or liberal versus conservative, or socialist versus capitalist, etc. But it's important to remember that not all biases are directly political. For example, here's a list of a handful of common cognitive biases. 
In other words, these are biases that we buy into kind of subconsciously. If you look up what these are and how they work, you'll notice a pattern here. Bias is defined not just by what we're paying attention to and what we're assuming, but also by what we're ignoring. Our job then as researchers is not only identifying bias, but also looking deeply and widely enough at our chosen subject so that we're able to discern when important facts are being left out. This does not mean that we should just throw bias sources out the window. It does not mean that bias sources are useless. What it does mean is that bias sources might have questionable reliability and they might offer an incomplete or problematic view of what's really going on. We can combat this by drawing from a wide variety of sources from different points of view and by gathering as many facts as possible to offset the ways in which some sources might want to brush a fact or two under the rug. As long as the facts we're gathering are accurate, this strategy will likely win out. We only get into real trouble when the facts themselves are being manipulated and distorted when we're being fed disinformation, when we're being lied to. We'll talk a lot more about that phenomenon in episode three. Until then, stay safe, Stay informed, and we'll see you next time.